All right, so I think we'll get started. Um, just a couple announcements before we dig in today. Um, <clears throat> first, we've set it on the office hours schedule, um, both for uh, PD, our RTA, and, and for me. Um, so my office hours will be on Fridays from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, this is tentative. We may change them depending on student needs and other scheduling conflicts and stuff like that. And then our TA, Priyata Sean, uh, has Wednesday and Thursday office hours, Wednesday, 1130 to 1230, and then Thursday, 5 to 6 p.m. Um, the rationale there is our homework assignments will typically be due Thursday evenings. So having a late Thursday and, and a Wednesday office hour for uh, Priya should help you guys, hopefully, uh, with homeworks. Um, so the second announcement then is about homework. Um, I haven't finalized this yet. Uh, we're doing a little bit of, of debugging and, and trying out solutions and things like that. But um, we have a draft of a homework assignment that we'll probably publish in the next day, um, basically by Friday. Um, so you can have some time over the weekend and then next week to work on it. And it'll be due next week, Thursday. And it'll basically cover the stuff that we've done so far, not including today's lecture. And then we'll have a following uh, week problem set probably about the stuff that we do today. Um, so basically, let me talk about the policy for the homework first. Um, I mentioned all this stuff on, on day one um, when we talked about, uh, <laughs> sorry, I got a little distracted by Zoom there. I mentioned all this stuff on, on day one when we talked about class policies, um, but let me just go through it again since now we're actually getting homework out. And a week ago is like ancient history at this point. So um, basically, you guys are welcome to work in groups. Um, and this is true whether you're um, participating remotely online or whether you're in the in-person section. Um, so if you want people to work with and, you know, you don't know folks in the class, um, feel free to reach out either to me um, or to Priyat Arshan, our, our TA again, um, and both of our emails are on the syllabus for the class, which is both on my website and, and on uh, Brightspace. So, um, yeah, work together if you want to. I, I encourage that. I think it makes it more fun usually. And, you know, you guys will be working in teams, either in grad school or in jobs and stuff like that. So why not uh, get more experience with working in in, uh, in groups on technical work. Um, but if you wanna work individually, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and either way, we require that each student uh, upload their own solutions. So even if you work in a group of five and you guys all have the same answers for everything, you each need to write up individually um, what you did. Okay, and then you upload those to Gradescope. And my recommendation, basically, I think there are three ways to do this. One is pencil and paper. And so I would say, you know, there you work up a scratch solution that might be messy or whatever. Um, and then you finally get all the problems right. And then you write up a clean, finished solution and you upload, you can take a picture of that or scan it and then upload it. Um, another way to do it is to work on a tablet, obviously, same deal. Um, write up a clean solution at the end after you've done all your scratch work and then save a PDF and upload that to Gradescope. Um, otherwise, um, you can use LaTeX if you like. Um, so again, you do your scratch work somewhere else. And then when you have the final solutions, most of which are only like five or 10 lines long, you type it up in LaTeX. And we will require you guys to use LaTeX actually both for the final presentations using a package called Beamer, um, which is what I make slides in, um, and also for the final project reports. Um, so it won't be super long, but you know it's good to get practice working with that. So any of those three ways is fine. The output of LaTeX is a PDF file and you can upload that to Grayscope as well. Okay, and then you can use any outside sources you want. So, you know, you can look up coding stuff on Stack Exchange. You can ask ChatGPT or Google Bard or whatever for help. Um, you can talk to students. You can use textbooks. You can just Google solutions online. That's all fine. I'm not going to police any of that. Um, I just ask that you cite your sources, right? So if you do use ChatGPT, just say, I use ChatGPT, right? And that's fine. I'm not going to take off any points for it. I just want you to basically declare the people who you're drawing from, um, the people you're helping, uh, getting help from, right? And then um, that being said, I, I really do encourage, like I can't police this, I don't have time to do it, but I really think that if you're interested in you know, deeply learning the material, that really good practice is to try the problems first without outside help, right? And you know, look at the slides, look at the assignment, you know, work through things, make mistakes, figure out what the tricky parts are, and then resolve those difficulties either yourself by trying it a new way or talking to a friend or using ChatGPT or whatever. But um, if you just jump to a solution, it, usually there's not a lot of learning that happens there. So. Okay, and then uh, our creator Sean will grade each problem uh, basically using a quick uh, three tier scale. So if, um, if the solution is missing, you don't write anything down, or you know you just write down a couple of words and not a real solution. Okay, you get a zero. Um, if you write down a bunch of stuff, but he, uh, Priya can't make head, heads or tails of it uh, because it's just really sloppy. Um, again, zero. 
right? Um, then if you write something down, it looks like a serious earnest attempt, but it's not super clear. So it's all scrambled up and there's lots of eraser marks and stuff and it's hard to tell what's a zero and what's an O or whatever. Um, then you get one point. Um, or if it's clear and it's easy to read, but um, there's a bunch of stuff that you missed. So either you left things blank or you got things wrong or whatever. Um, so then you get one. And then if your solution is clear and it's either completely or, or mostly correct, um, then you get the full, the full two points. Okay, so the first problem, basically uh, the first two of them will uh, call back to the linear ODE slides. And so the first one is basically just like parsing the solution that we've written down. So it's just understanding, you know, what the functions A and B are and what the initial conditions are and things like that and how to evaluate the integrals and so forth. Uh, the second one is basically a derivation of the solution to the vector linear ODE uh, system of differential equations that we wrote down. And so um, there is a solution process in the slides um, from last week, Tuesday, that basically goes through the derivation in the scalar case. And so all you need to do for this problem is essentially replicate those same steps, but do it in the vector case. And you need to pay attention to, you know, what's a vector, what's a matrix, you know, what is the chain rule in, in multiple dimensions and, and so forth. And then the third problem, basically you'll fill in two missing functions that I left out of a script that I will share with you, which is called the, it's the, the script that we did last time for the simple um, climate model, which again had linearization and time discretization in it. And so you'll, you'll fill in these kind of uh, functions for nonlinear simulation using ODE 4.5 and for linearized simulation using um, basically either C2D or the matrix exponential. And then there's a, a extra credit problem at the end, which is basically just mess around with that script. Change things, play around, see if something interesting happens, save a graph of it and tell us a little bit about what you found. Um, if you can break it, tell us how you broke it, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> so um, so that's it. And, and I hope it's not um, too terribly much work. I, I think maybe number three might be the, the most challenging one, but um, I think the skills you learn in coding that stuff up are, are useful in, in other classes and, and uh, so forth. OK, so um, any questions before then we get into lecture for today? OK. So after eating our veg durables for a long time, doing a bunch of math, today we're going to actually talk about a dir uh, batteries, actually two of them, batteries and electric vehicles, uh, which are basically batteries with wheels, as, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so. Um, we'll start by talking about basically batteries, um, a little bit about the chemistry. I'm not a chemist, so apologies to anyone in the room. If you are, I may get some stuff wrong, but um, just a, a rough understanding of kind of the physics and, and chemistry of how batteries work. And then we'll talk about um, when, if you want to model a battery, how to do that, and then how to get reasonable values for the parameters that go into a model um, so that you can simulate it using the tools that we talked about in the last couple of lectures. Then we'll talk about EVs, again, very similar, but obviously some differences. They like move around and stuff. Um, so we'll talk about basically how to model that. And then um, at the end, I'll do an example, which includes a few different policies for charging electric vehicles. Um, OK, so the basics of batteries. Um, so batteries, also known as electrochemical energy storage, they basically are conversion machines. They convert between chemical potential energy and electrical potential energy. So there, the electrical energy is stored essentially in electromagnetic fields, and the chemical potential energy is stored in uh, bonds between uh, molecules or atoms. And uh, most of the batteries that are in use today are what are called lithium ion batteries. So um, that means the components of the battery are made out of lithium. Uh, lithium ions are the things that move around basically to, to allow charge and, and current to flow. And uh, lithium ion batteries are used in pretty much everything that has a battery that you might have interacted with recently. So all of our personal electronics, including the laptop that I'm working with now, tablets, phones, headphones, things like that. Um, also the batteries that go into electric vehicles, um, by which I mean, you know, cars, trucks, vans, SUVs, but also personal, you know, smaller uh, electric vehicles like the e-bike that I sometimes ride or uh, electric scooters and skateboards. You see these all over campus, right? So those all basically are enabled by advances in lithium ion uh, technology. And then also home batteries, you know, things like, um, you know, battery that might go with a solar uh, photovoltaic system that would go on a, a building. Um, those are typically lithium ion. And then for really big scale um, energy storage. Um, so like most of the energy storage that's deployed uh, in the last few years in a state like California or, or Texas, um, most of that is also lithium ion battery. Although there are other technologies for grid scale uh, storage, and some of them are, are much bigger and, and uh, older technologies. 
And then um, the technology that underlies lithium ion batteries, um, it really it goes back to about the 1980s. And uh, it was commercialized in 1991, uh, actually in the late 80s through 1991, it was put into the first product and that was done at Sony. Um, the inventions really were done at, at SUNY Buffalo uh, in Western New York and then uh, UT Austin. And kind of the three people, two, uh, two chemists and then one uh, engineer um, who worked at Sony, um, they, they all uh, got the Nobel Prize together in uh, 19, sorry, in 2019. And I'm just going to pause for a sec because I realize my video is probably not recording here. I see. I didn't have screen share on. Okay. I may have to re-record this video, but anyway, that's fine. Um, okay. So how does a battery work? Um, well, let's talk first about the uh, constituents that make it up. Um, so uh, basically batteries are made out of electrodes um, and electrolyte, and then typically some sort of separator membrane, something like that. So there are two kinds of electrodes. One is called the anode. And uh, that's basically something, typically a metal, um, that emits electrons and ions as, as the battery is discharging. Um, so negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions, typically. And uh, in a lithium ion battery, that's typically uh, made from graphite. And then so graphite is basically carbon in a particular arrangement um, of, of atoms. And then uh, the cathode is another electrode, and, and that absorbs uh, electrons and ions during uh, this discharge process again. And in a lithium ion battery, that's typically made um, from lithium and, and some other uh, metals, something like cobalt, something like that. And then the electrolyte typically is a, a solution um, that allows ions in, in a lithium ion battery, lithium ions, uh, to move around, but it does not allow electrons to move around. And so that might be something like a polymer gel or some mix of salts and sol solvents and, uh, and other stuff that I don't fully understand. And then there's something in the middle called the separator that basically um, it has two purposes. One is it uh, blocks the flow of electrons. Um, so the electrolyte also inhibits the motion of electrons, but the separator does too. And then it prevents direct contact between the two electrodes. Because if you have that, you can get essentially a short circuit. Right? And that's typically made out of some kind of plastic, a polyethylene or a polypropylene, something like that. OK, uh, so here's an illustration of what the sort of electrochemistry looks like when a battery is discharging. So up here, we have a, a light bulb that's being powered by current flowing through. Um, a circuit. So this whole thing down here is is basically a cell of a battery. Um, all this stuff in, in white and gray, this is the uh, electro, sorry, electrolyte. And then this thing here is the, the separator, also known as a semi-permeable barrier. So this is like a wall of plastic or something like that. And then over here, we have the anode, probably graphite. And over here, we have uh, the cathode, probably lithium with some other stuff. So during this uh, discharge process, essentially we have um, things that are neutrally charged, um, basically splitting off positively charged stuff and negatively and, and electrons. And the electrons are allowed to move through the wire. Uh, the wire does not allow movement of um, the ions. The ions move instead through the electrolyte um, past this separator and over to the cathode. And then the electrons flow basically along a different path, but they end up at the same destination and they essentially recombine uh, over here. And because the electrons are flowing, we have you know, charges uh, in motion and, and from that we can get work and, uh, and that is what powers loads, uh, things like light bulbs and uh, so forth. And then in the discharge process, it, it works similarly, but kind of in the reverse direction. So now we imagine this thing is, char is plugged in and it's charging. And so again, we have this kind of process where we have um, you know, a formation of both electrons that move um, through the wire and of ions that move through the electrolyte um, over to the, uh, the anode where they then recombine. So um, this isn't super relevant to stuff we'll be doing, but I thought it might be interesting since we all have batteries and our own electronics and stuff like that. So um, this I pulled from a website at the University of Michigan and uh, gives some tips essentially to how to how to maximize the life of your uh, battery. 
So batteries degrade over time, as, as we all know, um, <laughs> sort of a, a planned obsolescence thing in a lot of technologies where um, the battery is an expensive component of you know, headphones or something like that. And oftentimes uh, devices are now made in a way that you can't even change the battery if you wanted to uh, when it dies. So we all have to buy new, uh, new widgets every few years. But um, that's for good reason. Batteries, uh, the chemistry degrades over time. And there are things that we can do to essentially decrease the, the rate at which they degrade. So some of them are related to temperature. Um, so you want to avoid uh, basically um, having your, you know, storing your, your thing at really high temperatures um, or at really low temperatures and charging at really low temperatures in particular is, uh, is not great. So um, did anybody see this? So uh, here in the Midwest, there was recently a really severe cold snap. I mean, it's getting a little warmer today, but yesterday was, was quite cold. And so uh, there were pictures in the news um, yesterday of basically lines of of Teslas parked at Tesla fast charging stations <laughs> that had just got, they had been bricked basically because it was, or not forever, but at least for, for now, because it was so cold uh, that the batteries had essentially stopped working. Um, so people pull up in charging stations, it's negative 10 Fahrenheit, and then they pull, you know, plug in and they want to charge the battery at a fast charging station, right? At, uh, you know, some really high current and, and that basically, um, Prize the battery or, or something. I don't know exactly the chemistry, but anyway, uh, just uh, just pointing out that uh, EVs are a pretty robust technology, but that um, they can degrade. Um, all batteries really can at very very low temperatures and very high temperatures. And so for that reason, there's a lot of engineering I think still to be done to make these devices more robust in, in extreme temperatures. Okay, we also want to basically minimize the time spent all the way at full charge and the time spent all the way at zero charge. So for some reason, it's better to kind of be in, in between. I don't know why, but uh, just reporting the news here. And then um, charging at really high rates, at really high currents, um, also can accelerate degradation of the battery. Um, so if possible, you want to do slow charging rather than fast charging. And similarly, really quickly discharging um, can also accelerate degradation. So in an electric car, for example, um, people say, EV, I don't actually, <laughs> I have a hybrid EV with like a 20 kilowatt hour battery. So, and it's not a fast or, or fun car, but, um, but a lot of EVs are fast and fun. And people say one thing they like about them is that they're really zippy, right? They have a lot of pickup. They can accelerate really quickly. Um, and that's basically because a battery can discharge at super high power um, to provide really, you know, a rapid uh, movement. But I, I guess that degrades, um, degrades the battery more than needed. So if you're worried about keeping your EV healthy as long as you can, uh, drive like a grandparent. And then there's other stuff, obviously. So uh, moisture, so lithium in particular can be really reactive with water. So you want to avoid um, getting a battery wet, uh, bashing it around, and then other stuff that the manufacturer may require. So this is tangentially of interest to us, like in, in uh, some projects that people do, actually, even in the research world, is figuring out how to optimize the charging of something like a phone or a laptop or an electric car um, when you're concerned not just about you know, providing an amount of charge by some deadline, but also about maintaining uh, health of the battery, extending its life, and so forth. And so there you have trade-offs between wanting to charge quickly so that you know, in case somebody unplugs the device, they have it fully charged. And then on the other hand, wanting to charge slowly, for example, to maintain the healthy battery. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about how we model batteries. Um, and again, these are you know, sophisticated devices and you can kind of get as complicated as you want with all the physics and the chemistry, um, but we're just gonna take essentially a first cut or maybe a second cut model. Slightly better here what I'm presenting than or more accurate, higher fidelity than what you might see in a lot of research papers, but uh, only like one step better. You can of course get as deep as you want. So um, generally speaking, a battery, so the, the state, we can think of it as the stored energy, and this would be chemical potential energy. Um, so that changes in a linear fashion where the derivative is proportional uh, to the negative of the amount of energy stored divided by some time constant, tau, and then plus the power, the chemical charging power that we're putting in. And there's a relationship between the chemical power and the electrical power that I'll show uh, in a minute. But this term here, basically, it, it, uh, the fact that we have this negative x over tau uh, models self-dissipation of, uh, of chemical potential energy that's stored in the battery. Um, so if you, you know, aren't charging or discharging, this term is zero, you'll still have changes to the amount of energy stored in the battery because there are basically some sort of stray chemical reactions that can happen to essentially um, you know, uh, dissipate chemical energy over time. And that turns into heat and it's no longer useful. Okay, so then tau is a time constant associated with that. It basically governs, you know, if your battery is full, how long you have to wait until it's, you know, empty. 
And then, yeah, uh, P chem is the chemical charging power. And then we allow this to be either positive or negative. And if it's negative, that just means that the battery is discharging. Okay, simple enough. Any questions about that? Yes? Yeah, so the question just for folks on Zoom is basically, does this model apply to all kinds of batteries or only to lithium ion batteries? And then do the parameters change for different types? Um, Okay, so again, it, this is not a perfect model and you can get as sophisticated as you want. And, and those really sophisticated, you know, detailed models will be a little different for different types of batteries. But as kind of a, a first cut uh, model, this is, is good for any type of battery. Um, so whether it's a, you know, lead acid battery um, that people used to use in the seventies for like taking farms off grid, <laughs> stuff like that, or a lithium ion battery that, you know, some company just made today. Um, the basic idea uh, of the energy, you know, basically increases when you're charging it and it decreases when you're discharging and it can dissipate a little bit. That's essentially all that's happening in this model. So it's quite general. Yeah. And then the parameters do change. Um, so this time constant tau, some, some batteries dissipate more. They have more of the sort of stray chemical reactions that I mentioned than others. Um, so that that will change. Um, I see we have a question on Zoom. Uh, Aditya, do you want to go ahead? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's related to the temperature you mentioned before. Um, what particular component affected, by, affected the most by extreme temperature? I mean, uh, the component of the battery. What component of battery affected the most by extreme temperature? So what components of the battery are affected most by extreme temperature? Yeah, uh, you mentioned the schematics before, right? There's cathode, anode, and um, chemical, some, uh, what do you call it? In, yeah, something it's a, in the middle? Yeah, yeah, the electrolyte and then the separator. Um, so I, in terms of the chemistry, I actually don't really know. Um, I think the rates of chemical reactions are often temperature sensitive. So I think that's part of it. Um, but it, so the thing that I think is primarily um, like in terms of, you know, practical modeling and control of batteries, uh, um, I think it's the efficiency. And I'll show a little bit um, another plot of that, either in very cold or very hot weather, the efficiency of the battery uh, degrades. I haven't talked about efficiency, but yeah, that's on the next slide here. Um, and then also something about the capacity, its ability to discharge quickly. I think that can change in, in really cold weather, too. Um, yes, uh, okay. So is this peak hem thing, is that usually a constant value or does it uh, change over time? And uh, so I think like, you know, if I plug in uh, just some rechargeable, you know, double A AA or triple A batteries and stick them into the wall, typically those just charge at constant power uh, until they're done, right? But, um, you know, uh, a Tesla, plugged in to someone's house or to a fast charging station, that uh, actually might use kind of a weird charging profile, um, depending on something, optimizing health of the battery or you know, energy costs, if the prices are different at different times, things like that. So we'll talk a lot about uh, this sort of later in, in the semester about how to basically design this charging system for various objectives. Okay, good questions. Anything else? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so um, for folks on Zoom, the comment was that for lithium ion batteries, it seems like from kind of 20 to 80% charge, you can go really, really quickly, um, but 80 to 100 takes a long time or zero to 20 can take a long time as well. And I don't actually know if that's a function of like the, the chemistry and the physics inside the battery, or if it's, um, you know, that's something about uh, battery degradation. There's like more risk of that happening when you're either at the very high end or the very low end. And so for that reason, the people who design these charging schemes maybe charge slower, uh, you know, to be a little more careful at the high end or the low end. So I actually don't know, <laughs> but it's a good question. It's certainly something you can observe, like just from plugging in your phone, you know, if it's low or yeah. Yeah, good comments. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, again, this is just a plot from a couple of lectures ago, but this, um, so if that chemical charging power pchem is constant um, with this first order linear differential equation, this is essentially how the evolution of the energy looks. So we start from some initial energy, 
we're just charging constantly and we go through this kind of exponential approach curve. And we talked about how, you know, after say one time constant, we're about 63% of the way to our final destination. After two constants, we're about 85%. And after three, we're, you know, maybe 95% of the way there. Um, and of course, if we had stepped down, if we were discharging rather than charging, we would get a profile that looks like this as well, but it'd be exponential decay rather than this in increase. Thing. Okay, so let's talk about um, electrical and, and, and chemical power, the relationship between them. And to talk about those, we, we need to introduce um, two notions of, of efficiency. So here, eta uh, with the subscript C is a charging efficiency, and eta with the subscript D is a discharge efficiency. And those are both between zero and one. And uh, the electric power P with no subscript here is the chemical power uh, in the charging mode, chemical power divided by um, eta C. So if we think about, you know, this eta might be like about 90%, maybe 95%, something like that, then uh, the electric power is going to be uh, greater than the chemical power, it might be 5% above the chemical power. Right? And that what, what happens to that extra 5%? Well, it gets uh, lost essentially to the environment as heat. So, you know, if you touch your phone or your laptop after it's been charging for a while, it, it feels warm. And that's because there are thermal losses in the charging process. And then similarly, um, the power we get back out of the battery. So if the chemical charging power is, you know, one kW, we might get out um, 0.95 kW or something like that. Um, and again, there are losses as heat. And then we can write this piecewise linear definition thing here um, as uh, basically the maximum of two functions. Um, and I'll, I'll show what that looks like here. So on the x-axis, we have the chemical power that's going uh, to the battery, basically the energy that's being stored or the rate of energy that's being stored. And then the electric power coming from the grid is on the y-axis. So out here, we are charging. Uh, the gray dashed line is the line y equals x. And so out here, we're a little bit above that line because we have the slope that's 1 over eta, and eta is less than 1. And then down here, um, so we're uh, pushing chemical power to the battery, so we are charging. And, uh, and that means we're drawing power uh, from the grid. Sorry, down here, we are discharging. Um, we're taking power from the battery, right? And so we're a little bit above, again, the line um, y equals x down here. And so if you take the maximum of this line, uh, basically y equals x divided by a to c, that would be a blue line that would continue down like this. So the higher of the blue one and the orange one, which would continue like that, you get this kind of piecewise linear curve here with the blue and the orange. Does that make sense? So um, basically, this, this form, the max of the two functions, becomes easier to, to code um, than this piecewise thing. OK. Um, so you know, last lecture, we talked about discretization of, of linear systems. And um, in a scalar case, it's pretty easy. We can just write down uh, exactly what uh, the coefficients in the uh, discrete time model are. So we get that the new x of the next time step is equal to some constant a times the old x plus 1 minus a times the time constant tau uh, times the chemical power. And here a is uh, e to the minus delta t, where delta t is the time step, uh, divided by the time constant tau. So the argument that stuff that goes into what's called a transcendental function, something like a sine or a cosine or an exponential, that stuff always has to be dimensionless. So one way to check, you know, when you're doing problems like this to make sure you're on the right track is to look at, you know, what's going inside the, the e to the x thing here. Uh, and make sure that that stuff up there has uh, no no units to mention this. And this comes from basically just looking at the the scalar um, ODE solution and uh, and parsing um, you know in the simple case uh, what what the sort of a and the b functions are and, and so on. So if you want to prove that, you can go back and look at those slides. I, I won't belabor it. But anyway, we we get this nice kind of simple algebraic formula um, that's easy to code and, and easy to simulate. OK, and then batteries have constraints as well. Um, so they have constraints on the energy, and they have constraints on the power. And you could define the, the power constraint either in, in terms of the chemical or the electrical power. But usually what we care about uh, from a DER perspective is what's happening electrically, um, how these things are interfacing with the power grid or the uh, power system inside of a building. So I've written these th here in terms of the electric power constraints. So here, x max or x bar um, it just means an upper limit on x. So this is the energy capacity of the battery. Uh, and we use units of kilowatt hours, typically. And then PC, this is the discharging uh, power limit, again, in kW. And PD, sorry, PC is the charging. And then PD is the discharging limit. And those would both be in kind of electrical kW. 
And then if you need to, you can always write down the constraint in terms of the chemical power. And there we would just uh, divide through or multiply through um, the efficiency to get the relationship between chemical and electrical power. Okay, so those are the equations that like you can program into some, some language and, and simulate a battery, but of course you need data. You need to understand what the numbers in those equations should be. So let's talk about how to get those uh, parameters. So for a stationary battery, typically we have um, six parameters and three of them have to do with efficiency and three of them have to do with capacity. So the, um, the capacity parameters are the energy capacity, this X max, the charging power capacity, the Pmax C, and then the discharging power Pmax D. And then the efficiency parameters basically have to do with the self-dissipation effect. Again, these kind of stray chemical reactions, and then the charging and the discharging efficiencies. So uh, basically we'll go through and talk about um, each of those and, and how we can get numerical values for them. Okay, so um, if I just let my phone sit, and I look at the you know um, charge now, and then I look at the charge a day from now, typically it'll be a little bit lower. Um, and that may be due either to chemistry in the battery itself, or it may be due to like standby uh, processing stuff that's happening on the phone. And uh, how much do we lose? Well, it's gonna depend on, on the application and the chemistry and stuff like that, but it's typically in the range of somewhere around 1% per day. So not huge, but not a trivial effect either. Um, so how do we model that? Well, if we have, say, 1% to 3% energy loss, um, in the case where we're not charging, so we have kind of unforced dynamics, we're just looking at the decay of, uh, of the energy. And if we start with some initial value x0, then the solution, um, x of t, and you can get this by looking back at the ODE lectures, but it ends up just being e to the minus t over tau times this x0. So this is just exponential decay of the initial energy down to zero eventually. And so after a day, we have t equal 24 hours. And we have this thing, the ratio of X, you know, at 24 hours divided by the initial time is maybe 0.97 to 0.99, somewhere in there. And so from this, we can back out what the value of the time constant is. So we look up here at this formula, the E to the minus T on tau times X naught, and we just solve that uh, for tau. So divide through by X naught, uh, take the log, and then we've got a negative in here and we divide through and uh, that ends up being um, about 800 to 2,400 hours, uh, somewhere in there. So pretty long time constant. And often people actually will approximate these things as, as ideal in the sense that there is no self-dissipation. And they just assume this time constant is essentially infinite. And that's a pretty good model as long as you're dealing with you know, charging and discharging cycles that are happening over the course of you know, a day or two days, not months or, or, or more. Yeah, sure. So like the what you mentioned the time constant is the average of 2400, but on the charging curve, you mentioned that uh, like you get to like 63% of the final charge within one time constant. Does that mean it's like then 800 hours or like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, out here, if this was zero uh, T initial, and then we were up here at 63% or something, um, I mean, I guess if we were doing unforced, you know, just uh, decay, this would be negative rather than positive. But just flip this graph, and then, and then, yeah. So this, you could read off the time constant from a graph like this. Um, so you look, look for basically when are we sixty three percent of the way uh, to to the end goal, right? Which I guess would mean that if you start with one hundred percent energy, you end up with uh, 37 percent energy. So at that point, you would have uh, gone through one time constant. Does that mean it takes that long to charge it up as well, or, or is there different dynamics there? Um, does that mean it, it takes pretty quick for some batteries to charge? Um, so that'll depend. How long it takes to charge will depend uh, somewhat on, on the, the power that we're putting in, um, whether we're charging at 1kW or 10kW, something like that. Yeah. Um, but the time constant does influence that to, to some degree. Yeah. OK. Okay, uh, so how about, that's the efficiency stuff, or at least one of the efficiency parameters. So how about the capacity things? Um, so we'll get into this more as we get further into the semester, that choosing the capacities, um, you know, the power and the energy capacities for an energy storage system is actually a pretty interesting and, and somewhat challenging design problem. 
And there are rules of thumb for doing it, but to do it in some optimal fashion is um, maybe more interesting. Um, but anyway, we're not going to talk about that today. We'll just talk about you know kind of typical things that you find from systems that are deployed in the real world. Um, and more to the point, sometimes uh, limitations of the manufacturing process or the chemistry or whatever, the materials that you're working with um, may impose constraints on and, and coupling between the capacities. So for one example, and I don't know exactly why this happens, but if you just look empirically at, at the batteries that are out in the world, uh, you typically find that the charging and the dis discharging capacities are similar. So PC is about equal to PD. And then um, they typically have kind of in the, in the range of one to four hours of, of storage. And what that means is basically if you have zero charge and you charge at maximum, it takes you know somewhere between one and four hours to all the way fill up uh, your battery. And then another constraint that might come from hardware is that um, the wiring within a building might limit uh, the current or the voltage at which you charge. So we know that um, power is equal to current times voltage. Um, and so that might be a typical circuit for you know, a home battery, uh, might be somewhere between 15 and well, actually it could be more than this. It could be 30 or, or even uh, 40 or 50 amps, but it, it'll typically either be on a 240 uh, volt circuit or, or a 120 volt circuit. So like the outlets in this room are, are about 120 and then the, the fat outlets that you would see like your oven is plugged into or um, you know, an air, con air conditioner or something like that. Um, those fat outlets typically are, are 240 volts. So if you multiply those together, you get somewhere in the range of three to six uh, kilowatts. And so that might just determine your charging power. You might, uh, sorry, this should have a max over it, but yeah. And then um, just as one example, this is a, a popular home battery. I think this is the Tesla Powerwall. Um, it has charging and discharging capacities that are equal and they're both five kilowatts. And then the uh, energy capacity is 13.5 kilowatts. And so if you take the ratio of those two, 13.5 divided by five, you get that this thing has about two, two and a half to three hours of, of storage. And that's a pretty typical value. About four hours of storage is, is usually about as much as you get from a typical lithium ion battery. Okay, um, so to talk about the efficiencies, yes, question. So this time, does that refer to the primary so it can be either, right? Because the charging and the discharging capacities, at least for most batteries, are, are usually uh, similar. So another way to think about it is if your battery is fully charged and then um, you know somebody comes to you and says, hey, I need all the electricity that you can give me, right? You, you discharge at full blast. How long can you keep that up for? That's another way to think about it, right? Um, but they end up being the same. Yep, good question. Okay, so that's four of the six parameters, I think, down. Um, so now let's talk about those last two, the efficiency of, of charging and discharging. Um, so to get at those, uh, there's a concept that people use often. You'll find this on like a spec sheet for a battery if you're thinking about buying one, um, a, a round trip efficiency. So the basic idea here is if you, you know, fill the battery up and then you empty it back out, um, how much electrical energy is basically lost to heat in that process, right? Because there are thermal losses both during the charging and the discharging phase. So we can figure that out and we'll think about it in the, in the uh, case of a battery, a sort of an ideal battery that has no self-dissipation or the time constant is very, very long. It goes to infinity. Okay, so there, if we think, uh, you know, for one time step, let's say that we charge at a power P in. So then um, if we go back to the discrete time dynamics for the system, we get that the new stored energy, XK plus one, that's just equal to the old stored energy plus uh, the time uh, step, delta T times the efficiency times the power. And so this actually comes from solving the original um, ODE. So not actually the, the discrete time version that I put up. It's, it comes from solving the ODE when you have essentially infinity for, uh, for tau. Um, so then that term negative x divided by tau becomes zero. And your equation gets very simple. It's just dx dt is equal to p. Right? So if you solve that, you get this just kind of, um, it's like a constant uh, or linear motion sort of uh, thing. OK, so that's our. Uh, stored energy at time k plus one. So then let's suppose that we uh, discharge the energy at time uh, over between times k plus one and k plus two. Uh, and we do it such that we return the battery to it at its initial state. So it has the exact same uh, amount of stored energy in it uh, that we had at the beginning of the process. So if it was full, we take it back to being full. 
OK, well, um, we can write down a, an equation again for what xk plus 2 looks like. Um, so this is just xk plus 1. And then rather than having plus delta t times the efficiency of charging times the charging efficiency, we would have minus delta t times the power we're getting out of it. And this is electric power uh, divided by the uh, discharging efficiency. And then we have an expression for xk plus 1. So we can kind of iterate here and take this right-hand side and plug it in for xk plus 1 down here. And now we have an x appearing on the left. We have an x appearing on the right. So those will cancel. Uh, the delta t's will cancel. And then we can move the uh, negative term over to the right-hand side here. And we get that uh, the charging efficiency times this charging power is equal to the uh, discharging power divided by the discharging efficiency. And so from that, we get that the amount of power we got out over that uh, second time step is equal to the product of the charging and discharging efficiencies times the power that we put in. So if we run at 10 kW um, charging for an hour, um, and then we do the reverse, we discharge for an hour in order to bring the battery back to its initial state, then we get um, this product, A to C times A to D uh, times that 10 kW. So this thing here, the product, we call the round trip efficiency of the battery. And typically, it's kind of in the range of about 90% for a lithium ion battery. So if A to C times A to D is about 90%, and typically you know, the charging and the discharging efficiency for a stationary battery are kind of similar, um, so then we get that A to C and A to D are roughly equal, and they're both roughly equal to the square root of the round-trip efficiency, the 90%. And so we get from that that they're about 95% each. OK, so just to summarize all this, I probably should have highlighted some of these. But um, anyway, we can set the time constant um, probably usually closer to the higher end here. Um, efficiency is about 95%. And then either we can pick an energy capacity that's kind of reasonable for our application. I don't know, suppose that you want to be able to uh, air condition a building for a whole day uh, running just off of you know one charge of the battery. So you might say, OK, how much energy do I use for air conditioning? I don't know, 10 kilowatt hours in a day or something. OK, so then that's how much I want for the energy capacity of the battery. And then you might say, OK, set the charging and, and the discharging uh, constraints to be about somewhere in the one to four hour range uh, relative to the, the energy capacity. And then alternatively, you can say, well, what kind of circuitry do I have in the house? Right? I have a 240 circuit, or I have a 120 circuit. Um, or, or in the building more generally. You might have higher voltages if you're working in an industrial facility or, or a commercial building. And then what's the current limit of the wiring going in? Is it a 30 amp circuit or a 50 amp circuit, something like that? And you multiply those two and, and that basically determines um, how much uh, charging power is available or, or discharging power you can do. And then again, you assume eh, kind of one to four hours, somewhere in that range, pick some reasonable value in between three or two and a half or whatever. And then that determines um, the, the charging power. Oh, sorry. That determines the uh, energy capacity. This is actually wrong. <laughs> so I should say X bar is approximately equal to this stuff. So I'll fix this and put an updated version of the slides up uh, soon. OK, so that is stationary batteries. We're going to move on to talking about EVs, again, batteries with wheels, basically. Uh, but before we do that, does anybody have any questions about the stationary case? Yep. So yeah, so the question is, um, so that time constant, um, how does that influence if we're doing some kind of larger scale application, like a, a big uh, battery, you know, hundreds of kilowatt hour or megawatt hours rather that that's going to be used on, on the grid, maybe next to a solar farm or, or wind farm, something like that. Um, so really, I think that the time constant is, is pretty similar, whether you're dealing with a big battery or a small battery. And I think the reason for that is basically the chemistry is, is relatively similar. Uh, and bigger batteries mostly hook together more cells, um, basically stack together either in series or, or in parallel. Um, so the technology is, and that's assuming the chemistry is, is the same, right? And so today, lithium-ion batteries kind of are what's being used everywhere for the grid scale stuff, all the way down to the stuff that's in, in a phone or something like that. And so we get many, many orders of magnitude of, of power and energy capacities um, that, are, that are being spanned there. 
But um, you know, battery research is a super active field, and there are tons of startups constantly, you know, trying to come up with new chemistries and new materials and things like that. And um, there is a use case on the grid, which is not just sort of day-to-day -day energy storage, but you know, energy storage between seasons, for example. Um, so if you have you know a ton of solar power on a grid in a place like California, it's going to produce a lot more energy in the summer than it does in the winter. And so you might want these kind of interseasonal energy storage things that you could charge up at the end of the summer and use um, for some of the winter. And so um, there aren't really batteries that are suited for that use case yet. There are researchers and there are startups who are working on that, but it's it's still an open problem. I think. Um, so there's a company called Form Energy that makes these iron air batteries that are designed for these very long duration uh, applications, but uh, you know they're still kind of an, an early uh, phase company. So. So yeah, and then that's part of it, right? That time constant, you know, if you're just cycling, you know, every couple of hours, it doesn't really matter if you lose 1% here or there. But if you're trying to fill up a storage device and then use it six months later, um, you know, if you're using one, losing 1% 1 every day, it, it'll really add up. You'll have no energy left right, when it's time to use it. So, um, so other technologies might fill that role better. Um, one that's commonly used for that kind of really long duration storage is called pumped hydroelectric storage. It's basically you have, a lake that's high up and another lake that's low, and you have uh, a pump that moves water up when you want to store energy, and then it, it turns into a turbine and you uh, get power back out. You let the water flow downhill, uh, basically, when you want to get a power back up. So that's uh, the main technology that's used for those long duration storage applications today, but uh, highly constrained. You can't really build pumped hydro in most places because people don't like it when you like chop the top, top off a mountain or something like that. So um, anyway, great question. We could go into much detail about that. And there are people, you know, all, all over Purdue and other schools who are working on stuff like that. Okay, very good. Other questions? All right, so let's move on to talking about EVs. Um, so I feel like I'm a little bit behind. Uh, I don't really want to rush through this stuff. If I don't finish it today, I'll just talk about it uh, next lecture. So anyway, for modeling purposes, at least, EVs are basically just batteries that move around. That means they're unplugged sometimes. And also there's you know energy usage from the batteries sometimes that we can't control. So we want to model those things, basically driving uh, distances and driving times, stuff like that. So they have the same basic dynamics and in discrete time as a, a stationary battery would. Uh, but we need to think about essentially how much energy is used for driving. And so if we drive a distance D in units of kilometers uh, between two times, you know, T1 and T2, something like that, then um, the chemical charging power we can write as uh, alpha, which is called the energy intensity in units of kilowatt hours uh, per kilometers or energy per distance. It's that times the distance. So if you multiply those two together, you would get kilowatt hours. The left-hand side is in kilowatts, so we need to divide by the time step duration uh, delta t in order to get uh, agreement of units between the left and the right-hand side. So um, to, to your question, Aditya, this uh, thing alpha here, the energy intensity uh, is one thing that, that varies a lot uh, with temperature. So it depends on, on other things besides temperature. So um, how fast we're driving. So we know that wind resistance is typically proportional to the cube of velocity. So if you're driving really fast, you get sort of um, fast cubed dissipation of energy from your battery. Um, it depends on the weight of the vehicle. So if you're hauling an SUV up a big hill, obviously that takes a lot more energy than uh, it does to move a motorcycle up a hill. The shape of the vehicle. So if you're more aerodynamic, you're going to be more efficient. And the drive train efficiency as well. So uh, we have basically DC motors that convert the stored energy into rotational motion of a shaft. And how efficient those motors are um, really determines, uh, to some degree, the, the uh, driving intensity alpha. So just some trivia, a DC motor that, that drives um, uh, the powertrain in an electric vehicle is typically somewhere north of 80% of efficiency. And does anybody know the thermal efficiency of a typical internal combustion engine, a gasoline engine? Yeah, kind of 20 to 30%, something like that, right? So um, it's not an apples to apples comparison exactly because you have gasoline as the fuel source for one and you have electricity for the other and those have different costs and, and things like that. But um, just in terms of yeah, energy in, energy out, you get uh, uh, significantly higher efficiency within an EV. Okay, and in addition to that, uh, this driving or energy intensity of driving also depends on the terrain. So you can imagine if you're going over a bunch of hills, that's gonna um, cost you in terms of energy and then uh, the weather as well. 
And so that basically has to do with a couple of effects. One, um, you know, on a really cold day, like we had uh, the last few days here, obviously you're gonna be doing a lot of heating inside the vehicle. And so for that cabin heating, you're gonna need to use energy from the battery. Um, one of the downsides of an electric vehicle with, which has an 80 or 90% uh, efficient motor is that there aren't a lot of thermal losses from the motor. There's some, but it's not like an internal combustion engine where 70 or 80% of the energy content from the fuel just turns into heat. So you have this really abundant heat source from the engine block that you can essentially use to, to heat the cabin. So we don't really have that advantage in, in uh, electric vehicles. And so that can increase the, the energy usage. And then again, if it's really, really hot and you're running the air conditioner full blast, that's gonna use more power too. So that is one effect. The other effect is that the chemistry in the battery is temperature sensitive, like we discussed. And so in order to avoid basically operating a battery in a, a bad temperature range, what manufacturers often will do is they'll kind of wrap thermal management systems, uh, heat exchangers basically around the batteries in order to keep them in kind of a, a reasonable temperature range. And so those thermal management systems, if they have to keep the battery you know, warm on a really cold day or keep the battery cold on a really hot day, they're gonna use additional energy as well. Okay, so some numerical values for this. Um, for a typical EV, uh, the energy intensity might be kind of between 0.15 and 0.4 kilowatt hours per kilometer. Um, so you can multiply this, I guess, by uh, 1.6 to get the kilowatt hours per mile if you want. Um, so 0.15 here, this is kind of the best in class under the best possible conditions. So this is like driving a small, very aerodynamic car at moderate speeds on flat roads during kind of you know spring weather, something like that. And then the point four, this might be like driving uh, an SUV on really hilly terrain on a really cold or a really hot day, something like that. And just as a point of comparison, an electric bike or a scooter or a skateboard like you see all over campus has uh, an energy intensity that's typically 0 0.005, somewhere around that kilowatt hours per mile. So there's a factor of 30 to 80 difference uh, between these two. So um, if you think you know you have a daily commute, and you think about um, how much energy it takes to do that once in your car. If you had that same amount of energy, you know, that same cost that you pay to the utility company, uh, you could do your commute via bike or a scooter or something like that, somewhere between uh, for a month or, or three months, something like that. So the energy used for these smaller personal mobility devices is super small. It's basically nitrogen. Question? Uh, can you? Talk again about the difference between the stationary battery equation and the EV battery equation. Like I, I see the, the PCAM. This one? We're assuming it's not constant, it's something more complicated. But you've also got this mixture thing on there. Right, like the A and out. Yeah, the A and the Yeah. Like um, just, are we just adding complexity to this particular thing that we could have added to the stationary battery that we didn't? So the question is, um, just again, for folks on Zoom, sorry, I have to always do this repeating process, but um, so basically uh, what's different about the, the governing equation, the dynamics that I've written down here um, for the stationary battery case versus the EV case. So this equation, you know, we've got this mixture thing with the A and the one minus A, and that looks kind of weird. Like, where did that come from? So actually, maybe I'll give a homework problem that's like deriving this. If, it, if it's not clear where it came from, it's not hard, but it probably is worth going through the steps just to, to sort of convince yourself that this is correct. Um, but actually, I put this up for the stationary battery as well. Um, it was back 10 slides ago or something like that. But this it's the same equation. And uh, what the underlying assumption, it's basically two things. One is the governing equation, the continuous time ODE that I showed. The you know, dx dt is negative x divided by tau plus p. So it's that equation is the first assumption. And then the second one is that this P chem is constant over the time steps that we're looking at. So you know, if we use a delta T, that's a second, that's a basically a perfect approximation. If our delta T is an hour, uh, maybe it's not as good. But um, anyway, it's the underlying assumption that leads to this equation. And so this equation usually ends up being accurate enough for whatever purposes we want. Does, does that answer your question to some degree? Yeah, I okay. think I, I just missed the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these things I think will become second nature as you start to do them a little bit more in, in homework and stuff like that. Yeah, but good, thank you for that question. Um, okay, so this is a study that was done back in 2015, um, which now is almost a decade ago. 
But uh, some researchers at, at Carnegie Mellon uh, looked at, and I think this is only one type of electric vehicle, but they looked at for that vehicle uh, across different climate zones in the US and different weather conditions, what happened to the energy intensity of, of driving. Um, so you can see 20C, this is kind of like, you know, uh, typical, I don't know, Northern California conditions, right? And so early adopters of electric vehicles 10 years ago, like mostly were in California and Nevada and stuff like that. So um, kind of mild, nice conditions, a spring or a fall day here in, in Indiana. Um, but, uh, and, and so, you know, manufacturers, I think we're sort of designing for that condition. Also, there's not a lot of heating or cooling needed when it's 70 degrees outside. Um, but as you get hotter and hotter, this is extremely hot day, and this is a very cold day down here, um, you more than double the energy intensity. And this is for a, you know, a highly efficient, very aerodynamic, small vehicle. Um, so for an SUV down here, um, you know, this might be even higher, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. Okay, so um, real quick, you can write down the coefficients in, in that model. Um, so alpha, again, is the energy, energy intensity of driving. And then T here uh, for the coefficient values from that paper, T is in units of degrees Fahrenheit. So if you need to code this, be careful. Um, usually we'll use SI units in this class, but uh, for this model, you need to convert to Fahrenheit first. And then here are the numerical values basically that go into that function. So um, just as a resource in, in case you are interested for a project or, or a homework, something like that. Um, okay, so let's talk about how the constraints that we uh, mentioned in the stationary case get modified um, for the mobility case, the EV case. So obviously when an EV is unplugged, it can't charge unless you have a really, really long extension cord. Um, but uh, functionally, EVs that are driving have essentially no discharge power limit. So if you look at the, the rate at which energy is being sucked out of a battery, if you're you know accelerating zero to 60 in like one and a half seconds or whatever it is, uh, you find that it's somewhere in the range of like 400 kilowatts or above. So just for reference, um, a, a typical house in a hot sunny day using air conditioning might use four or five kilowatts. So this is like a hundred houses worth of, of power being dissipated. And then when they're plugged in, uh, EVs can, can charge, but they can't discharge uh, typically unless they have something called a bi-directional charging capability. And very few EVs today actually have that. Um, so we have a test house off campus where we're trying to get a bi-directional EV and a charging station. And there are basically two manufacturers in the US who, who make that. And uh, they each make it on, on only one model. Uh, it's the Ford F-150 Lightning. And then I think the Chevy Silverado uh, has an EV version. So two huge trucks. And uh, they have this bi-directional capability in part because it's a, it's a resilience thing, right? You can imagine um, during a power outage, if you have your car parked in your uh, driveway or, or, or your, your driveway or your garage, and uh, you know these things store enormous amounts of energy, enough to power a house for days or maybe even a week. Um, so during a power outage, you can imagine plugging your truck into your house and then just running everything in your house off of your car battery. And those trucks also have like outlets in them. So if you're at a, a work site, you know, you, you could charge power tools and things like that off of your car. Um, kind of handy. Yeah. I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how much like, so there's a mechanism um, in some electric vehicles in which like, when you go to slow down and I'm pressing the brake to slow down as it charges the battery. Um, do you know like how much that actually charges the battery or is it like quite minimal uh, kind of with the battery? Yeah. So the yeah, so the question is about what's called regenerative braking, um, which is basically the the brakes when you're going, say, downhill and you're riding the brakes, uh, they will recover some of the energy that would be dissipated um, via friction, usually, in the brake pads. They'll recover some of that and use it to recharge the battery. Uh, and the question is, how significant is that effect? And I don't really know. I'm not sure. So if you looked at a, a car, an EV, an ICE EV, with and without the regenerative, regenerative braking, like how would that affect the energy intensity overall, you know, the average over a year or something? Uh, I, I don't know. I would guess it's kind of in the 10% range. It probably depends a lot on like, you know, what kind of driver you are and what kind of terrain you're on, you know? <laughs> so you peel out of stop signs and then slam on the brakes, like it probably helps you more, but um, I don't really know <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's a good question. I, I can look that up. Um, okay, so so uh, how do we encode these constraints, the, the charging and the discharging constraints for an EV uh, into something like a MATLAB script that we might, might, well, yeah, might want to use for a homework or for the, the final project? Um, so it helps to define an indicator variable. So an indicator variable is just something, it's like a yes or no, a binary thing. And uh, it's one if some condition happens and it's zero otherwise. 
And so here we say this indicator is one if the EV is plugged in uh, over a time step K and, and it's zero otherwise. So this is basically saying, you know, are you on the road? Okay, if so, Z is zero. And then uh, the constraints for charging and discharging, um, rather than the stationary case where we just had this first constraint here, um, we apply that constraint if the vehicle is charged in, uh, plugged in. Uh, but if it's not plugged in, we just have the constraint that PK is less than or equal to zero. Um, and there essentially functionally is no discharge constraint for EVs that don't have this bidirectional charging. So um, if we had a constraint here, you know, that was like, uh, we could only discharge at sort of something like three kilowatts, um, that would effectively put constraints on how fast we could drive. Um, and EVs, you know, basically don't have constraints on that. Okay, so what are the parameter values um, for an electric vehicle? Well, the, the efficiencies, the tau, the ADAs, um, are typically about the same as, as stationary batteries. So you can kind of just use um, those same values. And then the energy capacity. So this will vary and, and it gets uh, uh, bigger if you have more expensive, you know, fancier uh, cars that have longer range. Um, but typically for, you know, the biggest one you can find, I think is the, the maximum range F-150 Lightning, which has 130 kilowatt hour capacity. Um, so just, just huge. Uh, again, that Tesla Powerwall that I mentioned, a, a home battery that's used for, for backing up a home is 13 kilowatt hours. So this is a factor of 10 bigger than that. And this thing is, it's not a cheap thing. It's probably a hundred thousand dollar vehicle. And a big portion of that is just the batteries that go into it. Actually, if you look at the frame of the F-150 Lightning, it's just a whole bunch of batteries. <laughs> it's just like the entire bottom of the, of the truck is just all batteries. And then there's four wheels and a cabin built on top of that. So. Um, anyway, and then going down to, you know, kind of in the 50 kilowatt hour range, um, and then hybrids will have much smaller batteries, you know, typically 10 to 20 kilowatt hours, something like that. Uh, and then the charging capacity will typically depend on whether you have what's called level one or, or level two charging. Um, so if you buy an EV, often you'll buy a charging station and it'll typically be a level two thing. And so an electrician will install it and they'll probably install new wiring. Uh, you know, fat wires that are rated at something like 40 amps or 50 amps, and they'll typically be a 240 volt outlet rather than a 120 volt outlet. Um, so again, a 240 outlet is something that you might see like a, an electric dryer um, or a, a big central air conditioner or something like that plugged into. So if you have those fat wires and a big outlet, you can charge at something like 12 kilowatt. Um, you know, so for a 130 kilowatt hour battery, this is still taking, you know, essentially 10 or 12 hours to, to charge completely. Uh, or if you have what's called uh, level one charging, also known as, as trickle charging, um, this basically can be done just with a typical outlet in a, in a garage. And you just have like, kind of like a normal wall outlet, a normal wall plug. And that will charge typically at 120. Uh, and then a typically cir typical circuit is rated around 15 amps. And so if you multiply the 120 by the 15, you get about uh, 1800 watts or, or 1.8 kilowatts. So roughly a factor of, I guess, six-ish difference between these two. And then again, for uh, EVs with no bidirectional charging, you can just take the discharge limit equal to zero. And then if you do have bidirectional charging, typically the discharge and the charge rates are, are about equal. And those are typically constrained um, by the wiring in, in the house or the, or the office or wherever. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about driving patterns here. Um, so just kind of some demographic stuff. Um, so in the US, the average household has about two vehicles. And again, these could be cars, pickups, SUVs, vans, whatever. Um, and then the average vehicle um, driven kind of by a, a typical American drives about 25, 26 miles a day. And that's typically broken up into about three trips, kind of on average three, you know, sometimes it might be two, sometimes four. Um, and each trip is typically around eight miles or about 13 uh, kilometers. So, you know, if you think about wanting to simulate an EV, um, you want to know how far it's driving so you know how much energy is being, you know, sucked out of the battery so that you know how much energy you have to put back in when it comes time to charge. And you also want to know essentially when those things are happening so you can plan, you know, when, when we should charge your vehicle. And so those typically happen between about 6 a.m. And, and 6 p.m. And there's a, a survey done by the U.S. Department of, of Transportation called the Nas National Household Tra Travel Survey. It's kind of a census type thing. Uh, where they basically interview people and, and ask, you know, how far did you drive today and stuff like that. And so they have published the data set associated with it. So I took that data and fit a, a, a distribution to it. So it's okay if you don't know what this means, uh, if it's been a while since you took a probability class, but um, 
it, it fits pretty well with what's called a log normal density. Um, so basically, uh, this thing comes from a, a logarithmic relationship with a normal or a Gaussian um, random variable. But anyway, so you can basically generate, and, and MATLAB have, and Python, uh, most languages will have a, a random number generator that you can pull from a log normal distribution, just like you would from a normal distribution or a uniform distribution, something like that. So uh, the parameters here are the mean and, and the, the um, standard deviation of the Gaussian random variable um, that's kind of in this logarithmic relationship with the, the log normal variable. And so you take these parameters, you call a random number generator, and you get a reasonable trip distance. Um, and you can imagine doing that a million, a million times to simulate sort of a million trips. And we'll do some of this in homework, and I'll provide some more detail on homework assignment. And then when do people drive? Well, so here I'm plotting um, the time of day with zero being midnight, and then uh, the probability basically of a trip happening or starting at that time. And uh, so you can see that, and again, this is from that same uh, very large data set, you can see that most trips happen basically between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. And they're roughly uniformly distributed over that time period. Like maybe they're a little biased toward the afternoon and you know stuff like that, but it's kind of smooth. So actually, when I first looked at this data, I was surprised. I was expecting kind of two peaks, you know, a, a lot of trips happening in the morning when people commute to work, and then a lot of trips happening in the evening when they come home. Um, but a couple of things here is that, um, first of all, a lot of people don't work on that schedule, and so they take trips throughout the day. And so those folks are mixed in with the, the kind of nine to five crowd as well. And then this also includes weekends as well as weekdays. So, you know, car use is much more irregular on, on weekends, I think. But anyway, again, you can imagine, like if you just want a quick and dirty way to generate kind of reasonable looking data to use in some simulation when you're modeling a bunch of EVs, you could say, eh, generate about three trips per day and uh, just pull them kind of at, at random times between 6 a.m. And, and 8 p.m. Okay, um, so then the last topic that I wanna talk about in the last few minutes here is policies for charging electric vehicles. And actually, these are kind of similar to policies for charging uh, a phone. So first of all, what do I mean by policy? Um, so I'm not talking about government action right now, although we may talk a little bit about policy in that sense uh, in this class. So policy basically means a, a strategy um, for you know, choosing you know, how, how to do something dynamically, right? So um, you can think of a control law in a, in a controls type class as one type of, of a policy. So uh, in the EV context, it basically means like, you know, what, what should you do? What, what, you know, if your car comes home and you plug it in, should you start charging right away? Should you wait a little while? Should you charge full blast? Should you charge at a lower rate? You know, stuff like that. So these are not optimal policies in any sense, but they are kind of easy to simulate and they're sort of reasonably uh, model what people do when they actually plug in a car. Um, okay, so again, we're using this indicator variable Z to describe these and, and Z is one when the car is plugged in and, and it's zero otherwise. So the first policy that I'll talk about basically just says, um, you know, when you, whenever you're plugged in, charge it full blast. And so this will basically keep your battery topped off all the time. So if you surprise have to go on a road trip, you know, you just hop in and you've got a full battery, you're good to go. So to simulate that mathematically, we say either we are at the maximum, um, the chemical charging power is either our efficiency times our, our charging limit, or it's this other thing on the right-hand side. And it might not be obvious where this thing on the right-hand side comes from, um, but it turns out that that comes from the dynamics equation. If you just solve it for the power uh, and you plug in for xk plus one, uh, the, the limit, the maximum energy capacity. So this basically says how much power do you need to put into the battery in order to just drive the, the state to the, to the maximum uh, energy at the next time step. And you can see that by taking this thing on the right-hand side and plugging it in for pchem in the dynamics. Um, so if you do that, this is just the, the discrete time dynamics equation that I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. So you can see, you take this, you plug it in, the one minus a taus are gonna cancel here. And then you'll be left with just an x max minus a x. Okay, there's a plus a x over here, so those cancel. And so you can see that this ends up with x k plus one exactly at the maximum capacity. Okay, so that's our, our first and kind of simplest policy. Um, the second one, has like a threshold to it, right? It says don't charge, you know, if you're at 98%, don't worry about it. But once you're below a certain level, okay, then charge all the way and, and charge full blast until, until you're full. So this minimum, it might be, you know, 30%, 40%, something like that of the battery's capacity. Um, so 
we'll define another indicator variable, um, this Y. So we have Z that indicates whether you're plugged in, and then Y indicates whether you're in sort of a charging mode. Um, so we start with just what the previous value of that was. So if you were in charging mode an hour ago, you're in charging mode now as well. And then if you're unplugged, or if you've already hit the maximum capacity, then you turn off charging mode. Um, if you're plugged in, and if you are below the minimum capacity, so you want 40% and the batteries at 30 or 20, um, then we turn on uh, charging. And then at the very end, after doing that logic, you say, okay, if we're in charging mode, um, then uh, set the chemical power to, to this value. And so that again, is just the same value that we had uh, on the previous slide. It either is charging full blast here, um, or it's doing sort of whatever power is needed in order to put the uh, energy exactly at the capacity at the next time step. Does this make sense so far? Okay, and then there's one more, um, a little bit more challenging to simulate, but a little bit um, more accurate uh, reflection of, of what batteries with these kind of, you know, battery health management systems will actually do. Um, so suppose that we want some amount of energy by some deadline. So here X star um, is the, the desired amount of energy. So maybe I want uh, at least 80% energy by um, 6 a.m. tomorrow when I'm going to leave for work, something like that. Um, OK, so then if we charge uh, at a constant power P naught, and uh, I'm leaving this as a variable, we're going to solve for what this P naught should be, basically. But if we charge at constant power from time K uh, all the way through K star, um, so, you know, it could be hour three of the day right now, and, and K star could be hour six of the day. So if we charge at this constant power for that same, that full three hour period, um, then we can sort of iterate forward the dynamics um, to get an expression of what X at time K star uh, will be. Okay, so this is just writing down the dynamics, uh, the equation that I mentioned, the discrete time dynamics, and then we iterate it forward to get X K plus two. Um, Again, it's the same dynamics equation. We've just increased k to k plus 1. But we have an expression for what xk plus 1 is. So if we take this thing on the right-hand side and plug it in, uh, we get this line here. And then uh, we can basically distribute the a and, and uh, group some terms together, and we get this line here. And then we can kind of keep doing that process. So we could do it at xk plus 3, xk plus 4, and so forth, all the way until we got to the final uh, deadline, k star. And so if you do that, you get this formula. Um, and it says that at x k star, um, at that time k star, your stored energy um, will be this. And uh, I won't go through the details of how exactly we get there. But if you kind of squint at these lines, you can sort of see the pattern uh, emerging here. OK, so then we want this x of k star basically to be equal to x star, the, the desired um, energy. And so actually, EV apps often will allow you to do this, right? You can say, yeah, I want 80% energy at 8 AM. And so you can enter a deadline, and you can enter the desired energy. So then the policy becomes, it looks similar uh, in the case. Um, yeah, OK, so what this says basically is you either want to charge at this value here, or if this is larger than the capacity that you can actually charge at, right? So maybe the deadline is really soon. And we're at really low energy, and uh, and the user wants eighty percent or ninety percent energy, and we just can't deliver it. So in that case, we're going to do the left hand side thing here. We're going to charge full blast, uh, get as close as we can, basically, to to filling the battery. And then on the right hand side here, I've just said um, take this x of k star, set it equal to x star, and then solve for this thing p chem. And if you do that, uh, you get the term here that's in the the right hand argument. Okay, um, we're at time here, so I think I will start next lecture uh, by going through this example, which is going to illustrate these policies a bit. And so I might just do a quick recap of the, the three different policies as well. Um, but the slides are up. If you want to look through this um, now while it's fresh in your head, please uh, please feel free. Um, so we got another minute. Does anybody have any questions about stuff we talked about today? Yep. For the, for the energy intensity. So if, like, if you're driving, like, 
you accelerate really fast and then you just like start losing and you're not like using the gas. Yeah. Does that reduce the energy, the energy density? Or would that, since the car is physically still moving at high speed, would that still reach that criteria? Okay, so the question is um, about energy intensity. If I'm driving, I'm at a stoplight and then I like peel out really, really fast, but then I get up to whatever the cruising speed in the city is 25 or 30. And then I just sit at that speed for a while. Yeah, I'm like, I'm is not that gas it's just, cruising. just cruising. So how does that affect, you know, compared to slowly, smoothly, kind of linearly ramping up speed? Um, I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I, I, there are some non-linearities in, in the system that, that we haven't really talked about here, but so like the discharging efficiency when you're you know going full blast might be a little bit lower. You might be burning off more energy as heat during that process. Um, but yeah, I don't know, energetically, like, I don't know, you've got wind resistance and it's gonna be similar in either scenario. So, if, and the losses from friction in the wheels and stuff like that are gonna be pretty similar. So um, I think mainly it's gonna boil down to the battery chemistry would be my guess. Okay, very good. All right, so again, we'll get a homework assignment up probably either tonight or tomorrow, and it'll be due next week on Thursday. And we have office hours next week, so um, let us know if you have questions. Okay, thanks, and uh, sorry, I don't know if I said this, but no class on next week, Tuesday. We will have a class on Thursday, and we'll have a guest speaker, um, uh, basically a founder of a startup that works on DERs. Okay, very good, thanks guys.